thank you for coming to the third of the DBA March Madness presentations. So we'll be talking about SQL Server Security Best Practices. We're going to go uh, high level on a, on a number of things and we'll go deep on a few things. Uh, we're not going to necessarily rehash everything that's already out there on the internet. There's a lot of great people out there already publishing information, but we are going to cover, cover a couple topics that I have found that have made my life certainly easier as a DBA. And I'm hoping that you'll enjoy all this. Feel free, of course, to ask questions. And as you know, Crystal is making sure that this will be recorded so you can watch this webinar again at your leisure. Uh, who am I? Uh, been a DBA for a long time. I actually started off. Uh, I actually started off with a little uh, store, and I did a lot of PC support, and then worked my way up to become a Unix administrator. And then I've been a DBA for about 20 years now. It's kind of crazy. I've supported lots of different platforms: uh, Windows, Unix, VMS, Azure, and uh, different database engines. Oracle SQL Server, Ingress, also Pervasive SQL. Um, I've been there. I spend a lot of time now, of course, with the unfortunate the virus. It's not as hard to do easy to do these things in person, but our local SQL Server group is definitely working on doing virtualization, and that's what's happening across the across the globe. Is that PASS, who's the parent organization of professional association of SQL Server, has released uh, virtualization licenses so that uh, groups can continue to meet. So this is a great time, as I tell everyone, joining local SQL Server groups was very good for me personally and very good for my career. Met a lot of really neat people. So if you're not doing that already, you should look around, talk to the people. I also enjoy doing presentation at SQL Saturday. I look up SQLSaturday.com. You will find literally around the globe uh, multiple SQL Saturdays every week. Obviously, this is going to be curtailed a little bit right now with our social distancing, but the point is, is that there's a lot of people out there who are, would love to hear you speak. So if there's something you want to talk about, whether it be five minutes, 15 minutes, 60 minutes, go ahead and do it. And of course, community. Uh, can't stress that enough. So get out there and talk to people. Security. So anyway, a DPA topic. Security is your job. Uh, the DBA database administrator's job, while much maligned and expected to die at any time, still very much alive and well, thanks to the incredible amount of data that's out there, which is only growing in leaps and bounds. We're going to cover recommended practices for securing your servers and your environment. The DBA needs to be aware of the whole enterprise so they can make the business appropriate decision. The concept of the DBA hiding in the corner and carefully administering security is long gone. I fully believe, and I've told this to tell this to anyone, is that a good DBA understands the business, understands the customers, and understands the servers. You can't do a good job if you don't understand what's supporting your systems, who's supporting your systems, and what's driving the business. You're going to be a much more effective, not just DBA, but any sort of IT person. But nonetheless, the DBA is still considered the gatekeeper to the data in the organization. Just get out there and talk to your customers. Uh, you, you know, through conversations, uh, writing up documents. There's a lot of different ways that you can get your point across. So back in the day, and I'm certainly guilty of this too. It used to be that it was really simple that you could just use a domain admin account for the SQL Server user. It made things really easy. You just, you know, you just had one user and you had the same password for that one. It made things really simple. So that's not the way you want to do it now. Um, you can still have that SQL Server domain account. You can use it for sending out emails, for keeping track of the alerts, but you don't want it to have any actual rights on your servers anymore. Uh, all of my demos here are based on a SQL Server 2019 instance, but these practices have been around since SQL Server 2008 R2, I think, if not at least SQL Server 2012. So the point is, is that Microsoft has been paying attention to this and making sure that the a lot of the vulnerabilities are taken care of. One thing I'm going to talk about is passwords, too. It's a good practice to get in the habit of using something like password safe or some other password keeper to keep track of your SA passwords. So one of the things that's come across here is that Microsoft has made it so that you're using local accounts. Local accounts are nice and simple, and they reduce, reduce the attack surface. And you can see a picture right here. So this is from a setup of a SQL Server instance. 
And right here, where I'm waving my mouse, hopefully if you can see this, but either way, the account name. So you see NT service, and then you have a name for the uh, for the account, NT service. In this, and notice that the password uh, block is grayed out. I don't know what the password is. This is automatically set up, and this is maintained. So the point is that the DBA doesn't even have to know what the password is. Also pay attention to the startup type, and also the services. So let's go back and forth here. So the services, the things that you do need, the database engine and you need the agent. Most likely you'll need something like SSAS, SQL Server Analysis Services. You may need SQL Server Reporting Services. Uh, now in the newer days, since 2016, you may need Polybase, which runs as a different service. There's a lot of different things that run as different services. So think ahead about what you're going to need. And this is a bit of a balancing act because obviously if you install a new service, that means a downtime in your system. But if you install a new, a new service, that's also another attack vector. So think about it carefully, but the main thing you can do is that you can keep sure, make sure that that service is disabled until you might need it. So go ahead and install that SSAS, but make sure it's locked down and you're not gonna start up until your company actually needs the actual service. These are created automatically during the installation of SQL Server. You don't have to worry about passwords and the rights they're designed with the rights they need, and we're going to get into that. We're going to go dive a little bit deep with PowerShell and look at the file systems. Local service accounts work well for everything, well, most situations except for clustering. Uh, for clustering, there's something out there, group managed service accounts. I We're not going to talk about this at all, but in clustering, you have to have something that goes across multiple servers in order to for it to work, and so that's where group MSAs are going to work for you. Um, So let's talk about those file systems. So right here, using PowerShell. And if you remember correctly, we had on our, let's see, let me go back. So uh, we had a couple of different names for the agent, the database engine. The point is here, <clears throat> as you can see here, we're looking right here at the, oh shoot. Uh, right here at the C colon sign program files Microsoft SQL Server, which is the default file system for the SQL Server install. You can't even see the SQL Server account that was installed for the SQL Server engine, much less the agent. That's because there doesn't have to have that. Think of kind of like threading a needle. The file systems that are needed are exposed to that local service account, but you don't actually have to have the base account. Then we drive a little bit deeper going into the MS SQL 15 MS SQL server slash MS SQL. So we're going down two more levels. And at that point, you can actually see the NT service, the MS SQL server local account. And even at that point, it still only has read and execute abilities. It doesn't have full control. It doesn't need it. So we're going down, this is one, two, three, four levels before the SQL server local, the local service account actually has access to the file systems on the server. So we are talking about hardening the servers. And even though at the very end of my presentation, there's a slide that says, what do we not cover? Hardening servers. We're not, we're not going to talk in depth about hardening servers. Uh, it's important for the DBA to understand this. And I strongly encourage you to work with your infrastructure team, whoever they may be, because they are going to know a lot about this. But it's a good opportunity for you to work together with them, give your opinions, and hopefully come up with a good uh, end product that protects the business and protects the team. And we go a little bit deeper, we finally get full control for that local service account. This is on the data folder, which is where SQL Server should have full control. That's where all the MDF files are going to be located, ideally. So the again, Microsoft has set this up to protect you and protect data. They've ensured that you are not going to have, that that SQL Server account is not going to have any more permissions that are needed. If you're interested in how I did this, uh, feel free to send an email to myself or Crystal, and I can show you the little um, commandlet. This is something that I uh, grabbed off the internet. It's a handy little one, but it gives a nice picture. So just to go back, instead of using PowerShell, here is the same image that you would see if you went through the Windows GUI and you would look at the file system, that, again, the data folder. And then you would see the MS SQL Server user, and you would see the permissions that it has. 
So why is this important? So there's a good example of the principle of least, least privilege. We're going to be talking about that quite a bit during this presentation. Again, principle of least privilege. The point is, is that you need to only expose the amount of data, the amount of rights that are needed in order to get the job done. Microsoft, again, has set it up. <clears throat> They've refined their process over the years. This is so much better than it used to be back in like SQL Server 2005. Anyway, the SQL Server user has the exact rights that it needs in order to run the SQL Server database. You don't have to worry too much about it being an attack vector anymore because it's locked down. No passwords are exposed. Everything is controlled. Obviously, someone could still hack into the server. There's, everything is possible. But the point is, is that it's taken a lot of the worry out of the DBA's job now. Least rights of uh, least, the principle of least privilege, it can be used on any sort of concept, not only the systems, the database, the data, and the applications. As I joked before, you should tattoo it somewhere. So as a DBA, you need to balance practicality and security. Sometimes you are actually going to have to grant more rights than maybe you need comfortable about or uh, because the business needs it. That's okay. Uh, have you, um, is everyone here familiar with OneNote? It's one of, uh, I think, one of Microsoft's best products that they came out with a good 15 years ago now. It's been around for a long time. OneNote is your online notebook that you can keep a local copy on your PC and you can keep, you keep a local copy that's saved online. It's tied to your, uh, your Windows account that you have set up with Microsoft. OneNote is super handy. In fact, let's go ahead and we're going to show you just really quick all the debris on my screen right here. You can see here, we're going to be seeing this later on in the, I just think OneNote is so cool that everyone should use OneNote. Right here, you can see right here where I keep track of all my scripts and that's what I've uh, done in previous jobs. This is just, you have access to the copy wherever you have access to that account. And as you can see here, this is an older version. I know that the newer version of uh, OneNote one, no, 2019 changed a little bit, so they put the tabs on the side, but I still like the old version right here. The point is, is that once again, if you're put into that situation, you just go ahead and you document what you're doing, put in your OneNote, communicate to the business and saying, hey, we're doing this. This is maybe not best practice, but we are doing this in order to get the job done. So sometimes maybe someone comes to you and they say, we need to have access to the system right now. Fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grant rights to this user and make sure that they have access to the data, to the database, whatever it is that they need. I'm going to write it down. And then I'm going to take a little bit of time afterwards to do the job properly. I'm going to come up with that custom role. I'm going to come up, I'm going to review what's truly needed by that user, that service account, that application. And then once I'm done, we'll go back and we'll put that solution in place. That's going to be the permanent solution. It is okay to exceed the boundaries of this when you need to in order to get the job done. The DBA should be working with the business, not being a blocker. As we shift gears a little bit though, so during the installation process, one of the things you're going to come up to is you're going to come up with that, that the uh, much lined SA account, mixed mode authentication. I personally like mixed mode authentication. Um, and maybe that's because a lot of companies I work for, it's been needed. So one of the things to remember in whether you like it or not, um, so first of all, uh, right here, you can see right here, we have our password. And we can add the uh, users. First of all, I'm going to go backward on my slide here. Remember, even if you're in Windows authentication only, the SA account's still there. It's used to run the master, the MSDB, TempDB, model databases. It's the owner of those accounts. So it's not going away. You can see right here, um, you know, you have a choice between Windows authentication mode and mixed mode authentication. Yes, Windows authentication mode is more secure. But that doesn't mean that the SA account goes away. You can't just hide it by doing that. So one little trick that people forget about is that let's say you go ahead and you set Windows authentication mode. Guess what? There's still an SA account out there. And you need to put a secure password onto it. 
So if you do decide to go with Windows authentication mode, I mean, think about it. All it would take is that you go in there and you could just do a simple registry hack to uh, switch over to mixed mode. And then all of a sudden you have an unsecured SA account. So going back a few steps, if you're, uh, even if you're doing Windows authentication mode, go ahead and put in a secure password for the SA account. I'm talking about a secure password. So there are lots of information out there on securing a SQL Server. Uh, but what some of the steps I think that are simple enough for uh, that should be followed and should be a basics for any installation. So first of all, set up a huge secure password. One of the little tricks that you can do is that you can rename the SA account. You can go right into SSMS and you can change the SA account, even though it'll still be the same. So that will delay an attacker for a short time. Another thing you can do is you can disable the SA account if you want to. Uh, SQL Server is still going to work. Uh, the agent's still going to work. Jobs are still going to run. Emails be sent. Everything, all these different parts will still be running. But one of the gotchas there is that you need to document that part very carefully. Because if you were to install an update to SQL Server, apply a patch in any way, most likely you're going to need to have that SA account up and fully running. So be careful before you go through the disabling account part. Uh, let's see, where are we? But talking about passwords. So as I said, I use password safe. There's a lot of different password keepers out there. They're either free or really cheap. As you can see right here, uh, instead of using the default policy, use the policy below. So go ahead and put in all the different options here. Password link. I have it right here. This picture shows 16 because that's what you get right when you go to your own policy. You can run that number up as high as you want. And you can change the amount of odd characters in your password to make it more secure. What I find funny is that when I use this and I generate secure passwords for non-SQL server sites, like if I'm going to something like, let's say Amtrak or something like that, or some other, some other company, but when I'm generating, oftentimes I'll find that the password is too secure. And so I have to go through and I have to maybe remove a couple special characters. SQL Server doesn't care. SQL Server likes secure passwords. So go ahead. Um, so when we're going back, when we're talking about installing the installation, so you go through and let's say you're a DBA and you have five different SQL Server installations. So on each one, you need to have an SA password. Great. You should never actually need to log on as the SA account. That's your fail safe. So use your password keeper generate a really secure password, and then lock it away. One of the nice things I like about password safe is the fact that if you pay a little bit of extra money for it, you, it allows you to actually have a USB key. So if you really want to make sure it's secure is that you plug in your USB key with your password safe, generate your secure password, and then go ahead and disconnect the USB key. So that way you there is no record of that SA password anywhere if, even if someone were to hack into the network, it's all in that USB key. So you just pull it out when you actually need to access that, uh, access that SA password. Another feature uh, about password safe is that if you also want to, you can use a UV key for uh, multi-factor authentication. But going back, it may seem like a lot of SA passwords. So let's say that you're in a more realistic install that you have 20, 100, 500 SQL Server installations. Yes, it's going to take a few extra minutes each time you install it, but you can go ahead and set up that super secure password, put it in your password safe, even if you have to do it for 500 installations, and then set it aside because the truth is you're probably never going to have to pull it out except if there's a big problem. And uh, you can also use this for all the other passwords that you need to keep track of in your environment. But talking about why we might need mixed mode authentication. So legacy applications required due to support of, uh, due to lack of support of Windows authentication. This is a very real issue. Companies can't afford to necessarily put on the latest, greatest bleeding uh, edge software. They oftentimes will have legacy systems. So you come in there and they have to have, uh, you have to have SQL accounts. Another reason is that let's say that you have a service account or a user, let's say a vendor needs to connect in. So it may not be from a trusted domain. And due to that, the only way is to once again, thread that needle 
is to set them up with a, uh, with a SQL account within the system, allows them to get in. Uh, linked servers. I know that you can use Windows authentication for linked servers, but it's kind of a pain, especially when you're talking about linked servers, uh, when you run into Kerberos issues. I've found that it's more complicated using Windows authentication. So think about what you're providing. So let's say that you need to provide an environment where you're linking two or three servers together. You go ahead and create the SQL account. You, the DBA, set the password. And then all you're providing to your customer, to your user, is just the, the name of the link server. That's all they need. They don't need to know the username. They don't need to know the password. They just want to have that link server. So then they can add that into their three, four part uh, uh, connection and they're set. So really, uh, by all means, if you can use Windows authentication, I think that's great. But personal experience over many years of doing link servers, it's a lot easier using SQL authentication. It takes a lot of the guesswork. I mean, one of the things I've learned, I have spent a lot of time as a DBA is troubleshooting connection issues. And sometimes it's just easier using SQL authentication. I'm not saying it's the best solution, but I'm just saying that sometimes maybe it's easier to make sure using SQL authentication that you get the core connection solidified, and then you put in a Windows authentication solution. So like I said, sometimes you need to exceed the boundaries of what makes sense for your application, for your business, and then you come back and you put a good permanent solution in place that's going to meet all the requirements. SQL Azure, uh, you don't have a choice in this one, you have to use SQL authentication. I understand that coming from your environment, you can still have Windows authentication only, but just to remember that SQL Azure, uh, unless you go into SQL Azure Managed Instance, you can't, you only have SQL authentication choices. So going back and talking about passwords again, uh, SQL Server allows you also to put in rules about password policy capabilities. Uh, you can set, you can tell it that you want to have, for instance, change on uh, change on login. You can set time periods about how often you want to do that. But here's something for you to think about when you're forcing your users to generate complex passwords, or especially if you're forcing them to change it more often. So let's say the user comes up with a really great complex password. They've got it, they understand it, they memorize it perhaps, or better yet, you've encouraged them to use some sort of password keeper as well. But if they're not using that password keeper, and then all of a sudden, here comes 30-day password change, and all of a sudden, they have to change it. So what do you think they're gonna probably do? Likely, the users are probably just going to change the number on the end of the password to another number. I'm personally guilty of that myself. It's easier than coming up with a super complex password every single time. And that's because as human beings, it's hard to come up with a 16, 20, 24, 32 character password that's made up of complex symbols without us putting in a pattern that maybe we used before. But if you use a password keeper, you can have that password keeper just simply change the password for each time and then it saves it for you. We've already gone over the fact that you can keep it on offline, uh, the point is, is that there are tools out there to make your job easier and still make sure that your environment is secure. One of the things that you're gonna run into is if you go darn down the road where you're not going to require users to change their passwords um, every 30, 60, 90 days, then make sure that your monitoring's up to stuff. Look for alerts. You can set right there, when you're setting uh, in the SQL Server uh, control panel, uh, you can set on the security tab, you can go ahead and set the part where it keeps track of successful or failed logins. You most likely don't wanna do successful logins unless you wanna fill up your SQL Server security uh, error log, but failed logins is a great idea. Set that up and then go ahead and keep your monitoring going. So if you start to see from a user that fails on their login multiple times, give them a call. Then at that point, uh, you can have a good conversation with the user and, I mean, first of all, find out and make sure that it is the user who is failing on the login. If it's not, great time to change that password. So let's talk about logins and users. I think this is probably one of the core items that most 
SQL Server DBA should understand. Here's my fun little analogy. The login is the access to the SQL Server instance, the permission to walk in the door of the house. While the user is the access to the individual databases that are the rooms of the house. So you um, you can have you can have logins logins exist without users, no problem. Then they still work. Users can actually exist without logins, but they won't work. So the idea of a zombie user. So my term zombie user is when you have a disconnect between the SQL Server login and the SQL Server user. This can happen all the time for a variety of different reasons. One of the main reasons that I usually found in uh, my environments is that when you do a restore of the database without going through and relinking the login and the user. Another reason that can happen is, especially with, uh, this is more prevalent with AD, uh, when you're using AD or Windows accounts, is that when users are turned from the business, uh, and then when their AD account is removed, well, guess what? You still have all that debris left over in your database instance. So that AD account is still gonna be there. It's not gonna be active in any way, shape, or form, but the point is it's still going to be there. Uh, so either way, um, the nice thing about when you do the restore of the database, uh, so the Windows accounts aren't affected by that. Uh, they automatically have account, they automatically will have access. Unless if for some reason the login was deleted, which could happen, but that's more kind of a one-off sort of situation. But your SQL accounts definitely will be affected. Uh, one of the things that I did as I uh, my last company is I wrote a little little stored procedure and it was part of the step. And so when we went through and we did the restore of the database, it would go through and it would automatically relink all of the SQL accounts. Uh, and that was simpler for everyone, and we didn't have to have any problems with users being unable to access their data. As far as cleaning up the debris, so a couple different points to be made here is that uh, in your department, there's probably gonna be someone, one of the infrastructure people who are going to be responsible for maintaining the AD accounts. So it's helpful for the DBA to be uh, on the email chain, keeping track of when a user may be leaving the company. And so in that case, you can know that you can go through and you can clean up the database at that point. Or maybe depending upon the business needs, you may need to keep the accounts away for a while. And so at that point, you just have to disable them. Either way, a uh, good practice of keeping, uh, keeping your database environment tidy is to go through every quarter, two quarters, even once a year, and just make sure that you're removing all those extra users that are left over from uh, users leaving the company. Uh, so 80 users, 80 logins and 80 groups. I'm a huge fan of them. Again, these are the Windows accounts. So this is if you went all the way back to that installation process. Um, well, whether you chose Windows, if you chose Windows authentication or mixed mode authentication, but the point is, is that these are the accounts that are coming in, they're coming through AD. Uh, like I said before, one of the nice things about having AD accounts is you don't have to worry about password policies or employee terming or onboarding. It's good that the DBA has the tools in order to set the password links, strength, and uh, rotation period, but it's nice to have another department worry about that. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about AD groups as well. AD groups are super handy for, um, you know, for setting up, for you having to have a minimal worry about the number of users that have access. You can spend the time doing what you do best, which is setting up those very uh, specific roles for access of users, but the AD group will keep you away from that administration. I put here. Um, And that's pretty much it. So let's talk about roles a little bit. Server roles, database roles, cinnamon roles. What's a role? It's a set of security instructions to which a user can be granted access by being made a member of a role. Uh, again, it's, let's say you're talking about some sort of uh, ERP type of application. If you're an AP, uh, maybe uh, a, uh, AP, uh, maybe an AP clerk might have the role that they might be have the ability to set up vendors. 
or but maybe the AP manager might have the ability to change currencies. You're going to find that different applications have predefined roles in them. Same thing with SQL Server. SQL Server comes with a lot of predefined roles. There are server roles, there are database roles, and then you can make custom roles. All these roles work together. They're providing a set of predefined rights and privileges that a user can then be granted access to. So we're not talking about cinnamon rolls, but we are thinking about the principle of least privilege. Ultimately, the rights of a SQL Server login are usually down to what abilities they have to influence the SQL Server instance, i.e. server roles, the SQL Server database. Database roles are the data itself, custom roles. Server roles. Uh, we're not going to go over all the server roles. There's lots of great information out there on the internet to explain all these roles. But we will mention sysadmin, which is the big one. Sysadmin is the one that has complete power of the whole SQL Server instance, and they can delete everything. You should be very cautious about who you're granting sysadmin to. Security admin is equally destructive because the security admin has, guess what, the ability to change the security. So even if the user only has security admin, well, they can give themselves sysadmin rights if they want to. This is one of the first cases where AD groups are a good idea. So let's say you could set up an AD group that is granted sysadmin rights. And these are obviously very special people in your environment who would have sysadmin. But the point is, instead of having multiple users that have sysadmin rights, you can also, you can just have an AD group where that you know that only specific people are going to be in that group. It's also handy for when you're dealing with auditing. Uh, you know, in, in my previous jobs, I found that I was uh, definitely included in the auditing process when auditors would come in to look at the environment. And <clears throat> auditors like to have everything clearly organized and documented. And so by using AD groups, AD users, um, and roles, you're able to clearly explain the way that security has been set up in your environment. And that's going to make it easier for the whole process. Database roles. Most DBAs are going to spend a lot of time at this level. You should not be playing with server roles very often. Again, these are all custom defined roles that come predefined by the SQL Server instance. Uh, one of the nice things about the roles for these databases is that they're only limited to the database and they cannot affect other databases. You can create a role in multiple databases that has the same privileges, but they can't actually talk to each other. Okay, there are ways you could make them talk to each other, but for this purpose, they really can't. The roles are still tied to the database level. Most of your users are only going to need the DB data reader role. If you're going to use the predefined role, which is great, they're there for a reason. Again, that gives them select to all the different data. Think about that. That's actually still quite a bit of responsibility. When you go back to your classic example of like separating sales and HR or something like that, uh, you don't want salespeople to necessarily see what HR sees, and maybe you don't want HR to see what sales sees. And so if you give a user DB data reader in the database, guess what? They can see everything that both sales and HR can see. DB data writer, again, considered a somewhat innocuous role, but the truth is that allows the right ability to update, insert, and delete data in the database. That means that that user has the ability to change things in the database. You don't want that to be done. Finally, the last role that you'll probably use more often in this level would be the DDL admin role, because that it gives the ability for users to execute stored procedures. Custom roles. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because I think custom roles are really cool. This is where you can really shine, and this is where you can apply the principle of least privilege. As I said right here in the slide, you can craft practical and useful roles for your customer that will protect the database, the data, and the user. Doesn't get any better than that. That is what your job is. So you add members, adding members to a role. So remember, we're talking about you have your logins, which are at the SQL Server instance. Those are the ones who have access to the house. And then you have users, which are the database instance. They're the ones who have access to the rooms in the house. 
either way, <clears throat> they are the the correct terminology is that they are members of the role. So you don't add a role to a user, you add a user as a member to a role. So as part as if you are doing a, whether you're doing, if you have a predefined role, that's one thing, but if you're doing a custom role, you design the, you design the role, you'll have access to tables and columns in the database. And then a user of the database, whether it be SQL Server AD user, AD group will then be added as a member to the role, and then they will then have all the access of that role. Here, I've specified here, this is kind of the basic using um, pseudocode to show you a role that we're going to go through and look at in detail. So, as you can see right here, you have your use database. You then create the login. Again, you're granting that service account, that person, whatever, they're being granted access to that SQL Server instance. In the local database, you're going to create the user because you have to have that in order to have access to the database data. Within the database, you then create the role. And then down the next couple lines, we're designing our role. So you maybe you'll grant insert on a table, you grant update, you grant select. And then finally, you execute the stored procedure SP underscore add role member to add the user to that role. So you can see here, so in my demo environment, what I did is I created a little uh, Windows group in here and added these three users, MW admin, MW test, and MW, MW test two. So we're gonna be using this for our demo environment. And then here is a the script, the same one that I showed you in my OneNote. Don't forget about OneNote. Here's the basic role that I created. Uh, we are going to go through each piece of this, uh, but as you can see right here, uh, documentation, another really important thing. It's, uh, you know, use this so you know what you were thinking about when you created this uh, role. You can see right here where we're adding the login. <clears throat> we're adding the user. Then we add the role, we grant the rights to the role, and then finally we're adding the local Windows group as a role member. Remember I said about how much I like Windows groups? So this is where this principle is put into play. So by creating this group that has these three users, it could be three users, it could be one user, it could be 100 users. The point is, is that everyone in this group can have the rights in the role. That's both a good and a bad thing. But the point is, is that if you've created a role carefully that meets the requirements of the business, then you just took all that administration out of your hands because now you just, it's a, you have that one group that has access to the role and you don't have to worry about the adding members to the group will be uh, taken care of by your infrastructure team. So again, we're going here, here we have the code. So let's go and get a little bit bigger text so you can see it right here. Okay, uh, connecting to the database. So one of the things that I like, uh, nice thing about roles is that you can just recreate them on the fly and it doesn't affect anything. So this is what I call defensive code and the idea we're using the if not exists. Part of this is from an automation uh, point of view. The idea is that you can put this script into place so that uh, you would make sure that the role is recreated every time that you, for, in for instance, restored a database. Or it's just handy, you could give this as a tool to maybe your help desk. And so then they could just run the SQL script and they could recreate the role because it could be that a common problem in your environment has to do with, for, for instance, for some reason, the role being deleted or something being changed. And so the simplest solution, instead of trying to troubleshoot, is just to recreate the role. One of the reasons we're doing this is also to remove error messages. If I didn't have this code in place, if this group, this AD group right here, this MW test one demo group is in place, then you're gonna get an error from SSMS when you try to create it. It's gonna say this group already exists. So by putting this in here, if not exists, create it, great. Same sort of thing on the database level, checking for the user exists, user existence, same principle. If this user already exists, don't create it. If not, go ahead and create it. 
again, defensive code. This keeps from having error messages. It makes things work better with uh, both with automation, but also uh, there's no reason that your code should be creating errors if it doesn't need to. Same defensive code principle right here for the role existence. Checking for this. If this role does not exist in this database, go ahead and create this role. Then we're going ahead and we're setting up our uh, select, insert, and update objects for the roles. So right here, you can see here that I am granting insert on the user's table to the role. Very simple. Now maybe think about that. That means that this role can write as many rows as they want to to this, this table. Now on the select table, or the select statement, I went ahead and I applied the principle of least privilege because we, that user does not need to see all the data in this table. Instead of doing select star, which maybe seems like a safe enough thing, I went ahead and I created it. I set it up so that in the table posts, this user only has select access on the title, the body, the tags, and the view count columns in the table. And then finally, in the update statement, I once again said that this user only has access to update the score column in the comments table. So look at these things again. This is this is where you really can shine the idea that you can drill down. It is a little bit tedious uh, setting this up the right way the first time. This is an opportunity to work with the business. Maybe you're talking to your application developer and the, you know they say, oh well we just need access. We just need um, you know we just need update on everything. Well maybe they don't. Maybe they don't need to lead access on these things. So work with them. Come up with a list of the things that the application truly does need and then create these very specific statements that once again are going to protect the users and the data and the business from any sort of accident. Because oftentimes applications are created hastily because we're all busy and we don't always have the proper test environment. This is your opportunity to make sure that nothing breaks. Finally, last thing right here, again, that execute that SD add role member. So you're adding the AD group to the role. Another thing to point out here is one of the things that's missing here are the users because they're here through the group. So if we go back up here, so this demo group. So notice here that we don't have this MW test and this MW test two. I've used the threading the needle analogy, but that's very appropriate here, right here. These users, the MW test and the MW test two, don't have to have logins in this SQL Server instance because they're added through the group. It can be just from a little bit junky in your environment to dangerous to grant extra rights for these users if they don't need it. So once again, as a DBA, you can control the access by users and make sure that only the users that need to have access to the installation have access. And by using it through a group, not only are you making the environment cleaner, because I've seen SQL Server instances where you have 500 lines in the, in the logins tab. That's ugly. You're making sure that you have this one single environment, this one single instance, and you know that only these specific users have these specific rights. That's the principle of least privilege in action and also keeps your environment sane. In my demo here, I am logging into the demo environment as an MW test user. Again, they don't actually have individual access. They only have access to the group. But because they have access in that group, they are able to log in. And then once I get in here into my SSS, SSMS environment, you can see right here, MW test. Again, this was a user that did not have individual access. It only had access to that group. So I went ahead and I tried to do a select star from the post table. And that was where we were very specific here, granting in the post table that I don't have, I can't just do a select star on the post table. I only have access to these four columns in the post table. So right here, when I'm trying to do it, it says, no, you can't do that. You don't have access to this column, this column, this column, and so on. There's a lot of columns in this thing. And because of that role, 
I don't have access to it. But so looking here, these are the four columns that I have access to: title, body tags, and view count. If I select those specific columns from the table, guess what? It works. That's the way it's supposed to be. This is again the opportunity as a DBA where you can set this up. It's actually kind of fun to get these things right and then you have them set up and then you have that confidence knowing that it's set up the right way and you can just go forward. Wouldn't it be better to set everything up right the first time and be able to do your work and not be able to and learn new stuff, go forward and do more useful things than rather spend a lot of time dealing with lots of individual requests. Get it right the first time and then just move forward. Looking at from the SQL Server GUI from uh, SSMS, you can see right here where this specific role is designed. And right here we have the post table, then we have the select right that was granted. And then once you highlight this line, this is when the column permissions uh, box will light up. And then you can see over here, um, what was the, the fourth one? Oh, body. So body isn't showing right here just to uh, these windows continue to still be difficult to use. But the point is, you can see here, you can see tags, title, and view count. So that, again, is the graphical version of this select statement that we created in our role. So I, um, what kind of questions do we have? I think we have anything. So it looks like we uh, just looking at the questions right here. And as I see the, um, we just went over a custom role example. So hopefully that was helpful. So what didn't we cover? We didn't cover server hardening. It is super important for DBAs to understand how servers work and the environment. And you should understand server security, but there's probably going to be experts in your organization that are going to handle that. Work with those server people. Uh, you know, provide um, your input on it. Uh, even help them out. Great opportunity to do a little bit of cross training, get a little bit better idea. But the point is that you already have people in your in your organization that are going to know how to do that. Encryption. There is so much stuff out there on encryption uh, that would be that would be multiple webinars. We're not talking about encryption right there. Uh, again, lots of good stuff out there in the internet. And the thing about encryption is that it's been evolving uh, over time in SQL Server. And I think it's important that you figure out what is needed for your business. I mean, we could go over the high level view of the different types of encryption where they're useful, but I think what's gonna happen is that you're going to Work with your business. You're going to look at maybe some of the um, the um, what's the word I'm saying regulatory requirements for your specific business, perhaps. And due to that, that's where you would apply certain forms of encryption. Appropriate uses of AD groups in the environment. I mean, you're probably thinking we just went over AD groups quite a bit. Um, so talk about what I'm thinking about here. So one of the things that I did put in here <clears throat> is that I created a name that was, um, you know, I was right here, name of the database and then the group. So using my uh, the word sensical, the point is here is that the, you go all the way back here, to demo group. So it could be that in this case, when I created the name, I just said role, so everyone knows it's a role. I mentioned the database, or you could put the application that's appropriate here. And then finally, put the group. Why not do this? It makes it a lot easier to understand what the purpose of, in case, let's say you're not there in the company anymore, or someone else is trying to figure out, um, trying to solve the problem. The point is that they can say, oh yeah, well, that's great. That's for this database, and this is for this AD group. And so then they can go look in the domain, and they can go find the name of that group. And they know what they have to do in order to fix the problem. Um, if that AD group requires file system permissions, oftentimes there's cases where there'll be users who maybe want to export data, there's different things, or maybe they want to import data. That's that's a whole other conversation you have with the business and with the infrastructure team. Let them take care of that. The point is, is that they can handle the management of the AD groups for you. And then just add it to your documentation in your OneNote or whatever place you want to put it. 
Um, we didn't cover any explicit examples of using the pre-created roles in SQL Server server role level and the database level. Uh, there's lots of great examples out there. I think that you're going to run into cases where you may have a good use for those. If that's the case, make sure you read through the description of the role very carefully and what it can do. Uh, there are some great documents out there, Microsoft Docs, that go into great detail of what all the different rights of those roles are. And some of them might surprise you a little bit. So definitely look, especially at the server level. One thing I didn't mention is that you can actually create a custom server role, or maybe I did, but anyway, the point is, is that that's a dangerous thing to do, but it's also sometimes what's useful for the company. So just remember that's one of those extra tools in your toolbox. And I'm sure there's lots of other things that I didn't cover in this presentation, uh, but the point is, is I wanted to cover the things that I found that are important that I found in my experience and where I've had the unique experience of dealing with these, uh, dealing with this information and found it was useful. What did we cover? We covered a lot. The uh, role of the database, the DBA in regards to security. It hasn't really changed. I think that the DBA is always going to be looked for, looked to in order to work on designing security practices. I know that there are oftentimes in bigger companies that you might have a chief security officer, um, you can have a security team, but the DBA is that one that provides that bridge between the policies and the actual putting them into place in the applications. This is where we can shine, use your skills, use your experience, put that into place. We talked a lot about best practices of a SQL Server install. Local server service counts, they're a great thing. It makes your life much easier. It's something that can be automated. Um, and we mentioned briefly about group, man group managed service accounts and how they are set up with the file systems. But if you are doing a some sort of a clustering environment, that's where you need to worry about group managed service accounts. Otherwise, for your strictly vanilla SQL Server installs, just use your, use your local service accounts. The controversy over mixed mode authentication and SA account. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there about why you shouldn't use mixed mode authentication. There's some stuff about why you should use it. Uh, again, I feel that used properly, mixed mode authentication is a good thing to have in your toolbox. Uh, one of the, uh, again, I mentioned how the, one of the most com complicated things you can do is trying to determine user access or service account access to the application. And it could be that you, if you can set up a SQL account, then you can go ahead and you can figure out, um, using that SQL account can make it easier and establish the basic connectivity to the application or to the database from the application. By putting that in place first, then you can go ahead and worry about the Windows account or the permanent account. Again, stretching that uh, privilege of the principal least privilege a little bit. Get it working document what you're doing, and then put the permanent solution in. We talked about passwords, manage your passwords responsibly. Go ahead and get a password keeper. It's a good, it's just a good practice, and you can use it both in your personal and your professional life. Difference between logins and users. Basic SQL Server concept. Get it, you know, just that's, understand that it'll make your life a lot easier. We certainly talked about the principal least privilege quite a bit. And then finally, roles on how to make rules to work for you and your business. Again, I feel that it's worth the time to put the effort into making a good custom role for your applications. Design them, put them in place, and then you can forget about them because you've already done all the work. Just keep the documentation out there. So let's take a look at the questions. Do we have any questions? Oh boy, uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, so I think um, uh, Sebastian Sankar, um, I think that I, I'd like to think that I provided some good examples for custom roles examples. When to use and limitations, um, the, I mean, that, I hate to say it, but it depends. I mean, you, you're you gonna find 
there's many times. So I know from you know working with different companies, oftentimes like I, I talked about the idea of an application. So let's say there's a custom application to, designed. So that application may inter, uh, integrate with your ERP with your application, and maybe it needs to have very specific uh, rights onto certain tables. And so that's where you put that custom role into place. You identify the tables that are needed. You find the columns that are needed, and then going um, that's where the role is put in place it's going to limit the access to make sure that the, that application can't do too much damage but it's also providing exactly the information that's needed for the application to work it's going to be probably a bit of an iterative process you're going to be going back and forth making sure to in order to get exactly right but once you get it right it should just work what are your thoughts on using schemas to create views and then granting permissions for roles to specific schemas? Um, Henry, can you go ahead? This is from Henry. Henry, can you go ahead and send me an email? That's a good question, but I think, I think first of all, we're almost out of time. And anyway, I think it's a bigger question that's put in this schema and I, in this presentation. I need a little bit of time to think about it. Um, so Henry, again, you can send an email to mwall at pragmaticworks.com, or you can send an email to uh, Crystal uh, K. Reyes, uh, Reyes uh, K. R. E. Y. E. S. at pragmaticworks.com as well. Encapsulating CRUD in stored procedures and functions. It's um, it just what you need to do. Um, try and think, uh, much like in the roles, um, you could do that. Uh, I would probably try to think, Leon, that's a good question. It's a bigger question. Like, again, it depends on what you need to do. What do I think about it? I think it's something that you should be careful about. That would be my first caution about encapsulating the stored procedures. But what do you think that stored, I mean, stored procedures are doing? If you pull any sort of application, canned application out, obviously the stored procedures and the functions are already doing those sort of uh, actions. That's what they're doing. So first of all, have a really good test environment. If you came to my very first presentation on backup and restore, you know that I'm a huge fan of restoring your production environment to test nightly. So do that and then uh, go ahead and test it out there first. But I think it's a fine idea. You're doing what applications are supposed to do. Tony, you asked about Password Keeper. I personally use Password Safe. Uh, I think it's a, a great tool. The free tool is awesome out of the box. I did pay some money to support the company because I like them. You pay money in order to be able to use the USB key feature. I mentioned that before. The idea is that if you have all your SA passwords saved on your USB key and then you pull it out and put it into like a little, uh, just, you know, a lockbox, keep it in someone's desk or keep it safe. So that more importantly, physical security is important, but in this case, you're worried about someone hacking into your environment and finding that password safe. So if you keep it on the USB key and you only pull out when you need to, then you don't have to worry about any sort of a digital uh, hack type attack. So I hope that I answered everyone's questions and I think we're about done RoboForm, Leon. Um, yeah, you know, Leon, you heard the email address. I would be, I have not personally used RoboForm before. So I'd love to hear from you about how are you using it. I think that would be an interesting conversation. So again, feel free to email me mwall at pragmaticworks.com. Anyway, uh, you've got the email address. Feel free to send any more questions. And so the next presentation is going to be on HR. <laughs> HR, it's going to be on HA and DR, uh, talking about how the two concepts are uh, oftentimes, uh, they're very similar. They actually mean different things. And we're going to talk about the differences and how you can use them in your environment. And then finally, the fifth webinar on the 31st of March is going to be, we're going to dive really deep into uh, Azure storage. A lot of fun. So, oh, Jody. Hi, Jody. I see Jody just said thanks. Jody's a good friend of mine, lives down in Tiger, so that's great that you made it here for my presentation. So anyway, thank you very much, and that's it, Crystal. All right, thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciate it. And like Michael was saying, um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Michael or myself. Also, you guys will receive the video in your email box tomorrow, probably around noon. So look out for that if you guys are interested in any of our DBA managed services offerings. 
I have put the link in the chat so you guys can um, feel free to check that out, as well as the link to the DBA, rest of our DBA Madness series. So stay tuned for the fourth part. We are almost to the end. Um, like I said, you guys can watch any of the past videos on this on this series, as well as any of our other webinars on our YouTube channel at PrideMatterWorks.com. But like I said before, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Michael or myself. I hope you guys have a good rest of your Tuesday. Stay safe and have a good one. Thanks so much, Michael, again for hosting. All right. Bye-bye.